example, as DITA OT, uh, XSLT, uh, XPath on the other, because it's really sort of the, the, the interconnection between the data that you'll be using as well as, and, and how to use that data, as well as how to then integrate that data into your style sheets, uh, using it specifically for things like cover pages, headers, footers, and the like. We'll discuss different strategies, and I'll try to leave some time for questions at the end. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. Who am I? Um, so I mentioned my name is Ruven Weiser. I have a background in computer science and education. Uh, I've worked with a number of different uh, computer companies and, and other companies in the programming field over the past decade working on things such as web applications, client server applications, um, a number of different uh, industries and a number of different technologies. Um, I've been working with Sweet Solutions since, uh, since towards the beginning and I do a number of different things for them. I have given on-site as well as online training seminars in the past. I do a lot of work with PDF and HTML style sheets. Um, I specialize a bit in CMS integration with a number of the different CMSs that our clients use, Vasant, Trisoft, and the like. And, uh, and I also manage projects for a number of our clients. Uh, a little bit about Sweet Solutions for those of you who may not be familiar with us yet. Uh, our mission, generally speaking, is to increase our customers' profitability by significantly improving the efficiency of their information development and delivery processes. That's basically uh, a technical way of saying uh, we help you with your information management. Um, and we feel that we offer a qualitative advantage by being with you throughout the entire life cycle. Uh, we offer content life cycle implementation from the original planning stages, information architecture, and so on, um, through the implementation, the design, the final output publication, as well as maintenance programs and, uh, and different plans afterwards to help keep things up to date. Um, after that introduction, I guess we'll, we'll move on, we'll get started. I don't see any questions yet, although I guess there's not much to ask, so hopefully uh, I'll continue to be as clear. Again, let me know if you have any trouble hearing me. First of all, we need to start with explaining what exactly is metadata. Um, and uh, there's a, a little cartoon here that, uh, that seems a little silly at first. One guy asks the other, what's metadata? And the other one responds, a word with eight letters. And it's not just a stupid joke, because that's exactly what metadata is. Metadata is information about information, or uh, more technically, although not so technically, data about data. Um, so in that case, saying that metadata is a word with eight letters is really metadata, because it's information about the word. It's not information itself that's, that, that defines the word, but it's information about that information. Um, it tells you that the word has eight letters without actually defining it. And metadata in the context of DITA is information, not content itself, but information that can describe the nature of the publication or a topic um, or the product about which the information in the content um, is. Uh, in other words, it's not actually information about the product itself, but it's telling you what the information is about. Um, I'll skip ahead to the examples on the bottom. For example, copyright information. That's not information about your product. That's not going to be on page 23, um, unless you happen to have it in the footer. But it's information about the information. When was this information copyrighted? Um, another example might be a product version, um, which again is not something that you would find in the actual content of the manual, but it's information about the information. What version of the product does this information apply to. Uh, or for example, source documents. Uh, one very helpful and, and useful type of metadata is to, to provide information about where the information in that manual came from. Uh, it may have come from a particular schematic or uh, design document. Um, and the advantage of that might be that that way, whenever that particular schematic changes, you then know which other publications you need to go and update accordingly, because you've been updating your metadata. You know that topics A, B, and C are dependent on that source document. When that source document changes, you may need to update A, B, and C. But why is metadata helpful? Generally speaking, it's helpful in our context because it allows for inclusion of information in your publication aside from the actual 
content of the document. In your topics, you're going to have information about how to do this, where to find that, what does this mean, what does that mean. Um, but you need some place to put your copyright information that's going to appear on your front page or your back page. You need some place to include your, your author information or your contact information that may appear as well on your front page or back page or in your headers, footers. Um, and that obviously doesn't belong in a topic itself because it's not information about the product, but it's metadata. It's information about the information. It's who wrote the information. It's where the information comes from, when it was published, when it was copyrighted. And all of that needs to be stored somewhere, again, in our, in our context for inclusion in the publication, um, and metadata is really the right place to do it. Metadata can be useful in other ways as well. Uh, if you have keywords, for example, in your metadata, then including keywords in your topics may be helpful for your, if you have that, the output on your web server, you have, may have a search engine that's able to comb those keywords and return search results accordingly based on that. Um, as I mentioned, the source documents also, uh, that's another useful um, implementation of metadata. But today we're going to specifically discuss how metadata is useful in designing your publication, in coming out with output uh, that's well polished and, and well designed uh, in the, our particular case, again, for cover pages, back cover pages, headers, and footers. Now that we've covered what is metadata, we're going to move on to the different options that are available for metadata. And then after discussing the information side of things, we'll move it along afterwards to exactly how to then use that information in your XSL. Any questions so far? You're all on mute, by the way. Uh, I'm not sure who, which of you have been on these webinars before. You're all on mute. So if you say anything, I can't hear you. Uh, the only way to get in touch with me at this point is either through chat or, or posting a question. So uh, apologies if any of you thought that I ignored you until now. OK, so we'll move on then. Um, what are your different options for using metadata, for entering information as metadata into your documents, into your topics, into your maps? So the DITA language itself already offers a wide variety of default metadata tags. Uh, that can be applied either to an entire map, whether that be a data map or a book map, um, or a sub map, or a particular topic. Uh, obviously, different pieces of information may apply, may have different scopes. You may have an entire document that's copyrighted. You may have different authors for topic A and for topic B, and therefore the author might need to be applied specifically to one topic or another, um, whereas the copyright information may apply to the map as a whole. Um, as mentioned, the, the tags that are available depend uh, very slightly, and we'll see some examples soon, depending on whether you're using a, a map, uh, an original you know, vanilla map, also known as a data map, uh, or a book map, which is the other option. And an excellent reference for all of this, uh, which is really invaluable to anyone either authoring the data or writing style sheets to process data, is the online language specification. Um, for DITA version 1.1, which is currently the, the current version. Uh, 1.2 is on its way, but it's not here yet. Uh, that URL will show you for every element what, the, uh, what it means, what the attributes are, what the sub-elements are. Um, so you can see, for example, in the book meta element, what are all your various options for including metadata. And let's, let's review some of those now um, to see what's available by default. If you're using the original type of map, also known as a data map, uh, then the metadata that you have available is the metadata that can be placed within the topic meta element. Um, and that includes the list that you see before you. Uh, the title is actually not in the topic meta, but it's still technically metadata, so I included it here. Uh, link text, search title, short description, author, and I'll mention here because we'll contrast it in a second. The author here is, is simply a... Uh, uh, you know, two words, first name, last name, whatever it might be. It's one string. Um, source, as I mentioned, source documents. Uh, publisher, which again, in this context, is just one string, um, the name of the publisher. Copyright information, critical dates, uh, permissions, audience, the category, 
uh, that may relate to the document, saying that it's a user guide as opposed to a quick start guide or a safety guide. Certain keywords that might apply, as I mentioned before, those can be particularly helpful for search engines and the like. Uh, product info, which itself has its own sub-elements, and you can see the details of that on the website that I mentioned. Um, and then other meta, which we'll discuss soon exactly what that is, a resource ID, and then data, which it, as well we'll discuss soon what that is. Um, those are sort of amorphous and, uh, and given to uh, flexibility. Uh, by contrast, book map or book meta has a few extra items and some, a few more uh, flexible, extendable items. Uh, for example, rather than simply having a title, you can instead have a book title, which allows for more than one title within it. You can have your main book title and your alternative book titles. Um, in that way, and we'll see an example of this soon, you can have more than one title for your publication. Similarly, author, which in a data map is just one string, the name of the author, in a book map becomes author information, where you can have uh, the author's name, where he lives, the phone number, and so on. And similarly with publisher information, that's sort of an extension of publisher. Uh, there's book ID, book change history, and book rights, which are expanded versions. Book rights is actually similar to copyright. Uh, which was in a data map and actually is, in, is the, one of the things that's not present in book meta that is present in topic meta, uh, but instead that here becomes book rights, which again offers you more uh, flexibility and structure than you would have had in a data map. So there aren't huge differences between a data map and a book map, but generally speaking, a book map gives you more places to put the information that you might need to include. And generally speaking, we do recommend to our clients that they use book maps instead of data maps for a number of reasons. But the greater flexibility of metadata is certainly one of those. Any questions before we move on? OK, then let's keep going. That covers the default options that are available in the DidoT language specification. As I mentioned, that URL is an excellent, excellent resource for that. Uh, the question becomes, though, what do you do if you need to include some information that's, that doesn't fit in any of those fields? Obviously, you can include any information you want. If instead of author, if you want to put a piece of information in there that has nothing to do with the author, no one's going to stop you. But obviously, the point of, of semantic tagging is to tag information with its meaning. And therefore, we need to understand the best way to get information in there if it doesn't really fit in the available tags. And for that, we have a number of custom options that are available. Um, there are a few different approaches to include pieces of metadata that don't really fit into any of the, the tags that are supported by the default DITA, DITA specification. Um, and those are, and we'll review these soon, um, the output class attribute, the other meta element, the data element, and specialization. Um, and that's sort of an increasing level of complexity and uh, robustness. We'll see how those work one by one now uh, and examples of where they might be useful and appropriate. The first example I'd like to discuss is output class. And you may be familiar with this from other data, data elements. Output class is actually an attribute that can be applied to uh, almost any data element. But let's see how it works in the context of metadata. So to give a scenario, a client wants a publication to have a title and subtitle on the cover page and a different title in the running header at the top of every single page. Uh, if you're working with a data map, you have one title element. That's it. If you're working with a book map, you really have two. Um, Within the book title, you can have a main book title and a book title alt. But here we want three different titles. So how do we manage that? Um, and the answer is that we can use the output class. As you see in the example, one approach to this issue, uh, not to say that the other three approaches that we're going to discuss soon couldn't also resolve this, but the simplest approach would be to add an output class. As our main book title, we have the title that's going to appear at the top of the cover page. And then we can have two different book title alts. The data specification allows for that. You can have as many book title alts as you want. Um, 
In this case, therefore, we can have two different book title alts, each with a different output class that specify their particular meaning. As you can see here, we have our main book title, which says Your New Gadget. That's going to be the top of the cover page. Right underneath that, we'll have our alternative book title, which will say an overview. And we assign to that an output class of subtitle. And then we have, in addition to that, another book title alt, which here we've assigned an arbitrarily named output class of header title that says New Gadget. And we can therefore design the style sheets, the custom style sheets, because this is obviously not supported by default. But we can de design the custom style sheets when looking for the book title alt to use one book title alt, namely the one with an output class of subtitle on the cover page underneath the main book title, and to use a different book title alt, namely the one with an output class of header title, when rendering the headers on every single page. And using that, we can basically use this output class to help distinguish between multiple instances of the same metadata. So if you have a few different book title alts, you can distinguish them using an output class. If you have a few different category tags, again, category is another metadata element of which you can have multiple instances, you can differentiate different category tags using an output class. But that's, I would say, the simplest way, um, but the uh, limitation of this, which is not a technical limitation but a design limitation, is that it assumes that you have a tag where your information fits semantically. You just don't have enough of them. So you want to have more than one and then you need some way to distinguish it. And in that case, output class can be very helpful. Any questions about output class before we move on? Moving on then, now that we've discussed output class, we will discuss the other meta element. And a scenario here is that a client wants to indicate whether a publication relates to a hardware product or a software product. Um, the problem with this is that there's really no default metadata element for that piece of information. Uh, I mentioned that there's a category tag, and category theoretically could be used for this. But technically speaking, category is meant to refer to the publication itself and not the product that it's referring to. Um, category would more accurately be something like user guide or safety guide, quick start guide, something like that. If you're talking about the category of the product, there's really no tag for that yet. Um, you could use the category tag. That's not really what it's meant for. And you may already be using the category tag for something else. You may not want to confuse it by having multiple category tags with different output classes, which would be an option. But assuming that you don't want to confuse it by having multiple category tags, another approach to help keep things distinct would be to use the other meta element. As we saw before, the other meta element is an element that's available in both topic meta for data maps and book meta for book maps. And that essentially is, allows you to include any name value pair in your metadata. In this particular example, we can include an other meta tag where the name is product type, and the content in this case would be software or hardware, whatever the case may be. Um, and in that way, you can include any piece of metadata that you want, uh, as long as it's relatively simple. Obviously, the name can only be a string, and the content also can only be a simple string. Once you're inside those quotes, you can't start including conrefs or italics tags or UI controls or anything else. Um, it's just going to be a simple string. But as long as the metadata that you have to include is relatively simple and straightforward, then you can almost create your own metadata tag. Uh, you can imagine this as if there were a metadata tag named product type, and the value that you're sticking in there is software. And you can have multiple other meta tags. So you can have as many of these as you want with different names and different values, different contents for each of them. Um, therefore, other meta is very helpful when you have um, information that doesn't fit into an existing element, or at least not into an, ex an existing element that's not already being used for something else. But again, it only works when your value is relatively simple. It's a simple string, one piece of information. 
that's, that's our coverage of the other meta element. Does anyone have any questions about that before we move on? Okay, then. Uh, the next thing that we're going to discuss, which provides yet further complexity, is the data element. And the use case here, uh, you can already see that it's a little bit more complex than what we've been seeing until now, is that a client wants to display a series of contact information on the back cover. Um, and here is the example of the contact information that they want to appear. They have contact information for their office in the U.S., for their office in Asia, for their office in Europe, for their office in the United Kingdom. Each of those pieces of contact information has the name of the company or the name of, of that particular office that appears in bold on the top. There are then a few different lines of address information, and you'll notice that the number of lines of address information may vary. In the USA, there are three lines. In Europe, there are, sorry, in the USA, there after the worldwide headquarters, which is the name of the division, there are two lines of address information. Whereas in Europe, there are three lines of address information. Uh, in Asia, there are three lines, and, and same in the UK as well. Um, so there's, there's a, a lack of consistency here, following which there are telephone numbers. And again, the number can vary here. There are two telephone numbers in the US, but only one everywhere else. And then some of these different divisions have a URL. Some of them don't, which comes at the end. You see USA and Europe have their own URL, Asia and the UK do not. Um, so what we see here is complex information with a need for great flexibility. And obviously, you should be able to tell already that this is not going to fit into an other meta tag. The other meta tag was meant for a single string. This is not going to work there. You could probably have a number of other meta tags, you know, division one, address one, and so on but you would really lose the structure that obviously is apparent in the information that we're trying to convey here because the other meta tags can't be nested in any way. They're simply one following the other. So the challenge here is that there are no default metadata tags that provide structure and allow that flexibility. We need something that will give us the structure that's inherent in this data, but allow us to be flexible by including as many addresses as we want uh, for different divisions across the world, as many different lines of address information for each of those, as many different phone numbers as we might need to include to include the URL or not include the URL. Uh, this is obviously more complex than anything that we've seen until now can handle. And for this use case, the data tag is quite well suited because the data tag is similar to the metadata, to the other meta tag, but it can be nested. And here, just waiting for this to show up, here you see in front of you what the data tag for that information might look like. You see that the data tag has a name value that can be assigned to anything you want. And you also see that you can nest data tags within each other. In this particular case, the solution that we came up with for this client was to create one overarching data tag called contacts. And then within that, we had individual, an individual data tag for each contact with the name contact. And within each contact, we have one data tag essentially for what is each line of that contact information that we saw previously. So the first line is given a name of name, and that's to help identify the first line as being that first line that's supposed to be rendered in bold. That way the style sheets can know that any data tag with a name of name should be made bold. And then after that, we can have as many different data lines as we want. So in the US, we have two data lines of address information. And in Europe, we have three. And the style sheets simply handle the data tags one by one, however many there may happen to be. And then at the end, we can choose to have a final data tag with the name of URL, or we can choose not to. And again, the style sheets will process that data tag last, simply based on the order. And if the last data tag has a name of URL, the style sheets will make it bold, as we saw. So just to go back to that, um, what you see is that this information 
which is what they wanted on their back cover, can be re-encoded using the data tag. And this gives us, as I mentioned before, a very high degree of both structure and flexibility. Because of the ability to nest, you can provide any structure you want. And because of the generic nature of the data tag, the fact that you can include any information in there that you want, um, and the fact that you can give a name to help identify that information, uh, that, really, um, that really gives us that flexibility. Uh, one second, I just see there's a question here. Um, the question was asked, why did you not choose to add a name value for the address lines to distinguish between street, phone, etc.? Um, that was something that was discussed with the client as to whether they would want that or not. Um, in this case, it was felt that because there was no difference um, in the output between all of that line, between all of those lines, um, that it wasn't necessary. This is probably an example of formatting having too great of a an impact on the the information architecture. Uh, from a purely information architecture perspective, you're right. We should have included information to say this is a telephone number, this is a fax number, this is an, an address line, this is a country, perhaps even. Um, purely from an information architecture perspective. The client in this particular case didn't want to have to tag all that information if it didn't matter to them anyway. Um, it's a lot to maintain, uh, and therefore that decision was made uh, because, again, bottom line, it wasn't going to make a difference. But that's a very good question, and you're right that from a purely information architecture perspective, it would have been more correct to tag each line appropriately, to say that this line, for example, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but uh, I'm sure you can understand what I'm talking about, that, that one line is, is a telephone number and another line is a fax number, and that way if it's decided later on that telephone numbers should be rendered larger than fax numbers, uh, that would be able to be handled easily. Uh, in this case, the client decided it just wasn't worth the hassle up front when they didn't foresee any practical outcome of that in the future. I hope that answers your question. Uh, any other questions about the data element before we move on? Okay. And that covers our data element topic. The final and, and most robust way to include custom metadata in your, in your document is with specialization. And specialization is a topic unto itself. Uh, it's really sort of one of the underlying uh, flagship features of DITA, Darwin Information Typing Architecture. Darwin, it's called Darwin because elements can inherit from each other. They can become specialized. Uh, and therefore, that really deserves its own coverage. But we'll just discuss here how it would help us in the context of metadata. So a use case in this context is that a client wants to, we'll, we'll go back to a previous use case. A client wants to indicate whether a publication relates to a hardware product or a software product, but doesn't want authors to have to remember the correct value for the name attribute. As we saw before when we dealt with other meta, the name attribute had to be set to something very specific. And the client also wants to limit the possible values to hardware, software, or system. The system being a combination of hardware and software. Um, the challenge here, the problem with what we've seen until now, is that with any of the options that we've seen until now, there's no way to limit the possible values. I'm sure you're aware that in DITA in general, there, are, there can be some limitations on values. Uh, if you're entering the um, placement attribute of an image, you have two options. It'd be either break or inline. I think I'm getting that name right. Uh, break or inline. If you're entering um, an ID value, there are certain limitations on how an ID can be composed. Those are some examples, but none of those uh, limitations apply to any of the examples that we've seen until now. Obviously, the, the big advantages of what we've been seeing until now, the big advantage is the flexibility, the fact that other meta can have any value that you want it to, the fact that data can be anything that you want it to. Um, so in this case, when the client wants to limit the possible values, what 
are the options? How can they go about doing that? Um, the most correct solution to that question is with specialization. Uh, for those of you who may not know what specialization is, just a quick overview. Specialization essentially means taking an existing data element and creating a, an inherited version of it that gets its own name and its own rules. So for example, data itself already has some specializations built in. There's a topic element, but then task reference and concept are specializations of that. And they have their own rules accordingly. There is an ordered list element, but steps is a specialization of that that brings its own rules. That steps can have uh, commands and results and step results and, and so on. Uh, so here we could take the category element and create a specialization of that. We could create a new element, a specialization of category called prod category, product category. We could give it any name we want. And then we could say that that element has an attribute called value. And just as other data elements restrict the possible values of some of their attributes, in this case, we could define that value attribute as having three possible valid values, either hardware, software, or system. And that would prevent an author, uh, particularly an author using an authoring tool, uh, such as XMetal, that can integrate with this new DTD the DTD being the document type definition where the specialization would be defined, uh, it would prevent authors from entering invalid values. And it would also, as mentioned, as alluded to previously, save them the trouble of having to remember the, the name of, the, of this element. In the other meta, they have to manually type in the value for the name attribute. They have to say name equals uh, product category. Here, again, especially if they're using an authoring tool, when they're inserting metadata, one of the options that they'll see for tags is the prod category tag. To the author, it'll be, in fact, hopefully transparent that this is a specialization and not a native data tag. Um, and using this, obviously, is really the most powerful. In a sense, it's the most correct uh, because it doesn't lend itself to abuse and overuse in the same way that some of the other tags do. Um, but it's certainly the most powerful way to include other information that you want because you can define new tags, you can create rules for those tags, you can say the product category can have sub-elements within it, um, as many as you want, or limitations and, and new sub-elements, and those sub-elements can have values, and those values can have limitations. Um, you can really create your own structure. You have the same flexibility and structure that you have with a data element, but here you're giving everything names, and you can assign rules that will dictate the structure. It gives flexibility in creating it, but then really keeps the authors in check in making sure that everything is structured as required. So as mentioned, specialization really requires its own uh, webinar to really delve into the details, but that's just a glimpse of how specialization can really help when it comes to designing metadata from an information architecture perspective. That's our coverage of specialization for now, and that brings us to the end of, of our first section, which are the different options for metadata, where you can include all that information that you need to fit into your metadata. Uh, any questions about this, about the information architecture side of things before we move on? to the style sheet side of things, how to then use all that metadata. Okay, um, so then we'll move on. We'll now see how to extract metadata using custom XSL. Uh, and again, this also really warrants its own webinar, which I know that there are webinars on customizing XSL and XPath and so on, but we'll just see some tips that are particularly useful when it comes to metadata. The basic technique for extracting the metadata from your book map is really the same as, as any other information that you want to extract from your book map. We'll take a look at one example here. 
uh, let's say for example that within our book map we have book meta within our book meta we have a prod info which has a prod name it then has a VRM list which is really a it's a version list which has one version in there which has a version attribute of 2.4 and on our cover page we want that 2.4 to appear we want in the bottom right corner we want the cover page to say um, you know product X version 2.4 so we need to in our front matter XSL uh, where we design our cover page we need to extract that version number from deep within that metadata so the correct way the right way to do this and I'll explain soon why it makes a difference is really to start at the top of the book map and map our way all the way down trace our way all the way down to this version number so within the book map um, if you were to open the stage one.xml file which you may or may not have heard about uh, but within within your book map there is an open topic map element but within that we start to get to the to the metadata so there's the book meta element within that there's a prod info within that there's a vrm list within that there's a vrm and from our vrm we want to extract the version attribute um, so in order to extract this version attribute we would have the XSL value of statement that you see in front of you. That's the right way to do it. The easier way to do it is simply rather than tracing our way all the way down through the tree to start off with a slash slash and those of you who already know XPath mean know that slash slash means find an element anywhere within the current document slash slash asterisk find the VRM element and from that get the version attribute. Uh, that avoids having to know that the VRM is within the VRM list which is in which is within a prod info which is within the book meta it certainly is a lot easier to read as well. Now if one of these is easier and one of these is harder why would we do it the harder way? Why would we ever do it the right way? Um, so for that we'll get on to some tips about the most useful and most efficient ways to access this information. Uh, and the first tip that I, that I give you here is that for best performance, avoid using the slash slash. As I said, the slash slash will give you that element that appears anywhere within the document, which means that in order to find that VRM, the XSLT processor has to scan the entire document to find all the VRMs. Um, depending on the size of your document and how much you care about efficiency, that can make a huge difference, especially if you're doing a lot of this. Uh, if you're looking for a bunch of different pieces of metadata throughout your publication, using slash slash all over the place can really start to hurt your performance. As opposed to the first usage that we saw. Sorry. The first usage, usage that we saw doesn't leave it up to the XSLT processor to find the VRM, it tells it exactly where to look. It tells it how to start from the beginning of the document and trace its way all the way down exactly where to find that VRM. So from a performance perspective, obviously the right way is going to be better than the easy way. Um, whether you care about that or not really is, is your decision. But generally speaking, if you do care about performance, you should avoid using slash slash as much as possible, especially if you can map it down to the particular instance as we do here in the right way. The second tip, uh, and I won't go forward to that slide because we'll be using this example again, is that you need to know where multiple instances are allowed and code accordingly. You may know that in your book meta you're allowed to have multiple instances of prod info because your book may cover multiple products. Similarly, within your, your VRM list, as the name implies, it can be a list of VRMs because you may have had a number of different versions of this product that it applies to. And therefore, if you want one version to appear on your cover page, and not all of them concatenated together, you need to know which of these elements can have multiple uh, instances or occurrences and code accordingly. So in our the right way, you can see that for prod info, we tell it to take the first product. That's this uh, brackets one that you see next to prod info which means that if this manual covers multiple products, 
in this particular instance, we would just look at the first one. And for our VRM, which again we said, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can have multiple VRMs within a VRM list. For VRM, again, we want to take the first one. Now, that's not necessarily likely to be the way that you would want to do it. It's, if it covers multiple versions, you might want to include all of them on the cover page, separated by commas. That would obviously be more complex from a programming perspective, and we won't cover that now. But you do need to at least be aware of the possibility to make sure that you don't end up with multiple VRMs next to each other on your cover page. This is especially true in our easy way of doing things, because a VRM can appear not only in your book meta, but in your topics as well. You may have a hundred different topics in your publication. They all may have their own metadata saying that this applies to version 2.4 of the product. And if you were to simply say, give me all VRMs throughout the entire document, you would end up with a hundred different strings of 2.4 concatenated with each other, all on your front cover. Um, so in this easy way of doing things where we're telling the transforms or the transforms are telling the processor to provide all instances of VRM throughout the entire document, it's especially important in that case that we include some sort of restriction. Uh, in this case, again, it's just a brackets one to give us the first one, but some sort of restriction to make sure that we only get one version number appearing there on the cover page as opposed to all of them. Heading back here to our tips, the third tip that I've included is that for easy reuse, you can declare variables. If you have the version number appearing in all of your different headers, and those of you who are more familiar with the XSL in the data OT may know that in the static-content.xsl file, there's different code for each header. Uh, you have the header on your odd pages and the header on your even pages and the header on, in your index and the header in your table of contents and the header in your, um, your back matter and the header in your front matter. And each of those have an odd and an even and potentially a first page and a last page. There are you know, a dozen different headers that are coded there. If you decide that you want to include your version number in all of them, it may be difficult to maintain, not to mention difficult to read, to include this code that you see in front of you in each and every header to retrieve that version number each and every time. And if you're doing it the hard way, sorry, if you're doing it the easy way of just using the slash slash, then as we mentioned, that hurts performance. And if you do that multiple times, it'll hurt performance even more. So the way around that is to use an XSL variable. And again, this tip is not something that's particular to metadata, uh, but it's a tip that comes in particularly handy when it comes to metadata, because metadata may be reused in different places throughout the publication, on the front cover and the back cover and the headers and so on. If you declare a variable called version, and you set the value of that variable to be the version that's in our VRM, then you now have that version available to you as a simple variable that can be used, as you see on the last line, XSL value of, and we select that version variable. And then you can reuse that version number as many times as you want without having to worry about readability or performance uh, or, or maintainability. Uh, because if you ever change the code that you use to retrieve that version, if you ever start to include, you decide that you don't want the first version, you want the second version that appears there, you change that in one place, and you can be sure that it will be changed consistently throughout the entirety of your document. So particularly for metadata, which is often reused throughout a document, it's helpful to make use of variables that will allow you to retrieve once and use multiple times. Any questions about these tips before we proceed? Um, then we'll move on to our last set of tips. Uh, and this is something that I know Adina, who's given some of the other webinars, has mentioned. But here in particular, where you're designing, let's say, a cover page, it's especially helpful. And that is when designing cover pages, start with the FO, which is the XSL FO that's used to render your PDF, and work your way backwards to the XSL. There is, I would say, a greater degree of graphic design that goes into the cover page then that goes into a content page. There are images laid out and logos and 
titles and subtitles and copyright information over here, and the exact placement can often be very tricky to get to, uh, to get right. And therefore, uh, rather than change your attributes file and run the did OT and regenerate your document, you know, and say, oh, I need to move it one more point to the left or one more point this way, or I need one more point of padding over there, and rerun the did OT processing each and every time you do it, it's much, much easier to work directly in your topic.fo file, in your XSLFO file, to make a change directly there, adjust your margins, adjust your points, adjust your shading, adjust your placement, whatever the case may be, and using your XSLFO rendering engine, whether that be Antenna House or Render X, open up that FO and see what it looks like. Rather than running your did OT each and every time, make a small change, see what that FO document looks like in your rendering engine, see if it suits your needs. If not, tweak again and open it up. When you're done with all that, then take the changes that you've made, the margins that you've set, the padding, the, the uh, placement, the shading, the font size, the line height, and all of those, take those and stick them back into your XSL code, uh, whether that be, again, in the actual XSLT processing or in the attribute sets. Um, that way you can design and then take and stick that back into your processing. Run the did OT once, make sure that it all comes out exactly as you expected it to look. Uh, and the final tip that I'd offer is that in addition to the metadata that we've been discussing, and this is theoretically, technically slightly off topic, um, there is other helpful information that can be stuck into your headers and footers. Uh, and this can often come from markers. A quick overview of markers who may not be familiar, a marker is an XSLFO element that you can stick into your document at any point or almost at any point with a certain piece of information. And you can then include a retrieve marker tag, as you see in front of you, that will include the nearest marker. So the most common usage of this is that at the beginning of every chapter, by default, the did OT sticks in a marker with that chapter name. And therefore, if you include this little piece of code that you see in front of you in your header, um, that chapter name, sorry, I should have been more clear, that chapter name is stuck in there with a name of current dash header. If you retrieve that marker that's named current dash header and you stick that information into your, into your header, that will retrieve your current chapter title and stick it into your header. It's not technically metadata, um, but since we're discussing designing headers and footers and cover pages, I think that it's, uh, it's very helpful to know that this is a way that you can also get sort of metadata into those headers and footers. Um, I say sort of metadata because the title, in a sense, is metadata. It's telling you what the content is discussing. Um, and that's one way to get the, the nearest chapter title or subtopic title, whatever the case may be, however specific you want to be, into your header by creating a marker and then dragging that marker into your header. Normally, headers are consistent from page to page, at least throughout the contents of your, of your body. But this is one way to have that header or footer change slightly over the course of your document by including the nearest chapter title using markers. Any questions about any of these tips? Okay, I don't see anything coming up. Um, that concludes the tip section here, which really concludes the, the entirety of this webinar, just to review, metadata is information about information, and it's really the most helpful way of getting information that's not part of your content into your publication. We saw the different ways that you can stick information into the default tags that are available, and we saw how those vary slightly between a data map and a book map, book map being the more expansive uh, extensive set of data available. And then we saw four different ways to develop your own custom options if the default options don't suit your needs. We started off with the output class, which is simply an attribute that can be added to distinguish between different instances of the same element. We saw the other meta tag, which is a way of adding your own name value pair, but it's specifically a string. We saw the data tag, which provides greater flexibility uh, and structure 
than the other meta tag does. Uh, one thing that I should have mentioned with regards to the data tag, in fact, because the contents of the data tag can be actual element contents, as we saw, rather than simply an attribute, you can stick other tags in there as well, potentially. Uh, you can have a conref inside your data element, uh, inside the contents of your data element. You can possibly have a, a bold or a, or a UI control or a win title within your, the, the contents of your data element. So that's another advantage of the data element. Um, and then the fourth option that we saw was specialization, which as I said is really, we really just touched the tip of the iceberg there, but that gives you the flexibility and structure of the data element, but allows you to define rules that will then limit that flexibility and structure and will help to guide any author who's using an authoring tool uh, in adding those tags and using those tags and in using the attributes of those tags. Uh, we then touched on how to extract this metadata. Uh, I just saw a question came in. Uh, how to extract this metadata, which again really goes into XSL as a whole. But we saw the easy way of doing it and the hard way of doing it, the hard way being the more correct way, the more efficient way, and uh, in some cases the more helpful way if you need to be more constrictive in terms of which actual information you're getting. Um, but sometimes the easy way, especially if you're not doing it that much, can just be a lot easier and worth it. Um, we saw a few other tips as well, which I won't review, but, but you can uh, review these slides afterwards. Um, I see the question came in. Can you be more specific about how one would create a choice list for a specialized metadata element? Um, that gets a little bit more into specialization. Um, and I won't start looking at a DTD now to show you exactly what that looks like, but suffice it to say for now, and, and I'll, I'll, send, uh, I'll send as a follow-up in an email, I can send you an example of what this would look like in a DTD. But in the DTD, you can define the allowable values for any attribute. Some attributes don't have restrictions on that. As we saw, for example, output class, you can type in any value that you want. Uh, ID is pretty much any text. Um, audience, platform, things like that, you can type in any text that you want. But it's part of the DTD of DITA itself that an image placement attribute can be either inline or break. And if you enter anything other than that, if you say uh, sweet solutions as that, your DTD will, will sorry, your DITA build will fail. Um, and that's specified as part of the DTD. A good authoring tool, therefore, will be aware of that DTD specification and will know that when you're creating an image and you want to set the placement attribute, will know that there are only two possible options here. There is inline and there's break. And some authoring tools will give you a drop-down list of the available options, um, which means that in order to do something like that for your metadata, you really just have to follow that same pattern. And I'll send the exact pattern in an email afterwards so that you can see what it looks like. But you just follow that same pattern of saying, I'm creating this new metadata element. In our example, we had prod category, which has a value attribute. And that value attribute can be either software or hardware or hardware or system. Those are the three possible options. If you type in sweet solutions, your build is going to fail because it's not valid data. Um, and again, a good authoring tool will be aware of the fact that there are three possible options and will give you a drop down with those options. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, let me know if it doesn't. Okay, I uh, haven't heard from you, so I assume that that did answer your question. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, if there are no other questions, then uh, we're coming in just in time. Um, if you come up with any questions afterwards, please be in touch with me. Again, my name is Ruven Wiser. Uh, my email address is right there on the slide. That's Ruven, W at sweet dash uh, And we're happy to help you with questions about metadata, or anything else that your company may need support with. 
Um, we can provide one-on-one -on -one support and training. We can provide custom style, style sheet solutions, CMS integration, uh, anything of that sort. We're happy to answer your questions. Uh, if we don't know the answer, we'll, we'll help you find it. So please be in touch with any questions or, or follow-up requests. And uh, I hope that you've learned from today's webinar and, and found it useful and that you continue to find it useful in the future as you start to work or continue to work with metadata and, uh, and using that metadata in designing your cover pages and uh, headers and footers. Thank you all for your time and uh, have a good day everyone.